In the third century BC, the victorious legions of Rome marched along the North African coast and developed the province of Cyrenaica. Today, in the Libyan desert, memorials still stand to that classic period. With the rise of Mussolini, Italian eyes once again turned to this province, and the dictator of modern Rome, aspiring to be protector of Islam, set out to recreate a vast colony on this site of early Roman greatness. Modern towns sprang up along the coast. Not the least important of these was the port of Tobruk, facing east and within easy distance of Sicily. After Graziani's brutal crushing of the Senussi, the Duce rode in triumph through the newest stronghold of Italian colonial power. On January the 2nd, 1941, this same stronghold of Tobruk, with its garrison of 15,000, fell to General Wavell's army of the Nile after a two-day attack. A month later, the enemy was swept out of Cyrenaica. Our forces, however, had to be denuded to fulfill our pledged word to the Greeks when they were invaded. Rommel's Africa Corps reinforced the battered Italians and our army was compelled to retire to Egypt. But if possible, one point had to be held, to Brook, shortly to become the symbol of our determination to strike a second blow. On April the 9th, 1941, the siege of Tobruk began. It did not end for 246 days. Australian infantry and British gunners dug themselves in and waited, not knowing from which direction the attack might come. A chain of minefields was laid around the town, ready for the panzer divisions now being brought up by the enemy. But from the beginning, it was an aggressive defence. These men did more than merely hold Tobruk. In the first eight days of the siege, they captured 33 German tanks, took 1,500 prisoners, and knocked 24 German airplanes out of the sky. An inner and an outer circle of defence posts were established in the desert around the town. Tonight, patrols made their way out into the rough country beyond the perimeter defences, gleaning information of enemy movement, skirmishing, or capturing prisoners for interrogation. As they returned in the dawn, the men of the outposts were standing too. Within the perimeter defences, the garrison settled down to a state of siege. Natural caves were turned into dwellings and the daily routine of eating, sleeping and fatigues was carried out despite continuous enemy fire. On two occasions, early in the siege, Rommel succeeded in piercing the outer ring of defences and making a gap which was only closed after days of bitter fighting. of the siege, the harbour was kept open by the British Navy. The danger of navigation in these waters was heightened by the number of Axis wrecks lying in the harbour, souvenirs of RAF raids when the Italians were in occupation. Running the gauntlet of shore batteries and dive bombers, our ships kept in steady contact with the men of Tobruk. Supplies were landed regularly, and every Sunday, pay arrived from Egypt. An interesting sidelight of the siege was the daily appearance of the Tobruk Truth, known to the Australians as Dinkum Oil. Soldier journalists typed out their copy and fulfilled the promise of their defiant slogan, Always Appears. The 76th Day of Siege. And so the days passed, fighting, resting, standing to, 24 hours a day, weekdays and Sundays.
101st day of siege. Between August and November, the British Navy carried out a feat unprecedented in history. Quietly and without fuss, the complete garrison of Tobruk was changed under the very nose of the enemy. At night, destroyers slipped along the coast within range of enemy guns, lurking submarines and aircraft. They succeeded in taking the garrison of 27,000 men off to Egypt and replacing it with 29,000 fresh troops. British, Indians, South Africans and Poles. And what was more remarkable, a complete tank battalion. In early November, General Sikorsky paid a visit to the besieged town and inspected the Polish troops. With wives, children or parents still in Poland, suffering the horrors of German occupation, these men had plenty of reason to hate the Nazis. The 215th day of siege. Towards the end of the year, Maryland bombers carrying out patrols over enemy-held territory brought back reports that Rommel was massing his troops for what looked like a large-scale attack. With the constant arrival of American lease land aircraft, tanks, guns and ammunition, fresh troops came to Egypt from Britain and the Empire. General Auchinleck's 8th Army came into being. On the 18th of November, 1941, the second advance into Libya began from the Egyptian frontier. Auchinleck's plan was to push forward towards Tobruk while the garrison there would break out and link up with the main force at El Duda, a long, low ridge seven miles south of the Tobruk defences. News of the advance was received in Tobruk and details of the plan were conveyed to the various units. Between Tobruk and the arranged meeting place at El Duda were many heavily defended enemy strong points, which were given nicknames by our men, such as Jack, Jill, Freddy and Walter. The first of these, two miles out, was Jill, and the success of the sortie depended on its capture. At dawn on the 21st, the men of Tobruk set forth beyond the outer perimeter defences. After the artillery barrage, men of the 70th Division attacked. The 70th Division was mainly drawn from county regiments. Essex, Bedford and Hertfordshire, York and Lancaster, the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers and the Black Watch. The 4th Tank Battalion advanced on the strong point with the infantry close behind. Heavy losses on both sides took place before the gallant Tobruckers could claim the first victory of the sortie. Jill was captured and 2,000 prisoners were taken with many guns and much material. British forces. On the 24th, the tanks were withdrawn for servicing and repair before the main assault on the heavily defended El Duda Ridge. There, in the front line, fitters, mechanics and armourers worked day and night in a race against time. On the 26th of November, the attack on El Duda was launched. Tanks moved up towards the positions strongly held by crack troops of Rommel's Africa Corps.
artillery was pressed into service, including guns captured from the enemy. on the escarpment itself. The British troops rushed the last few yards of the exposed battlefield and succeeded in driving the enemy from El Duda. They had reached the prearranged meeting place. the arrival of the 8th Army. When the attack was originally planned, the Tobrukas had said they would hang on to El Duda for three days, but after that would need help. The 8th Army, however, were delayed by a very stiff resistance at Sidi Rizeg. The holding of El Duda Ridge for nine vital days was probably the greatest achievement of the men of Tobruk. On the 27th of November, advanced units of the 8th Army arrived. Then, and then only, was the siege raised, a siege which has brought glory to the name of Tobruk and its gallant defenders. Axis planes in 3,000 raids is a thorn in the Axis flesh. Malta's value as a North African campaign developed in late 1942. Rommel in the desert, defeated and retreating, dependent for his life on supplies from Italy. While his tanks were burning and his men dying under the desert sun, he turned to Italy for reinforcements and supplies. Malta was our only base from which really effective offensive action could be taken against the enemy supply lanes. Malta, a thousand miles away from Alexandria and Gibraltar, but only a few minutes flying time from the enemy aerodromes to north and south. It was essential to hold Malta at any price. I was one of those privileged to sail with the now famous convoy of August 1942. Looking back, it's fascinating to see how that action fits in with the great campaign that came later and is developing still. When we learned we were going to Malta, everyone felt it a privilege to be going to her aid. As our convoy assembled, everyone knew we were sailing on an action equivalent to an offensive by several armored divisions in land warfare. 
Most significant of the escort vessels for this convoy were the four large aircraft carriers. Vice Admiral Seifert was in command. His flagship was the battleship Nelson, and with her was the battleship Rodney. The escort for the final dash to Malta was to consist of cruisers and destroyers under the command of Rear Admiral Burrow. One Sunday night, the fleet slipped through the Straits of Gibraltar under cover of darkness. All day Monday, Monday night, Tuesday forenoon, all was quiet. We waited. On Tuesday afternoon, suddenly the peace was shattered by a series of explosions. Great columns of water were thrown up as destroyers dropped depth charges. But the U-boat attack had been successful. The Eagle, an old but vitally important aircraft carrier, was sunk. When later in the afternoon we received a report of enemy aircraft approaching, there was a general sigh of relief at the prospect of getting to grips and avenging her. Those fleet air armed pilots knew their shipborne aircraft would have a tough proposition in competing against the shore based bombers, but somehow they achieved amazing results. in, the great mushrooms of water as the bombs dropped, and the blinding flashes of our guns, through all that and many other things, we were left with one main impression. Those merchantmen in the middle, going steadily on and on, at times completely hidden by near misses, but miraculously re reappearing through the columns of spray, and always doggedly and stubbornly going on and on. Flashes from our guns and tracer bullets lit the night sky. Now Wednesday. It was obvious that the enemy would throw in everything he'd got, as we would be within easy range of his aerodromes. Fleet air armed fighters were off at the crack of dawn. Throughout the day, they were almost continuously in the air as formation after formation came into attack. I won't attempt to describe that day in detail because one attack is so much like another.
gigantic pall of smoke rising up into the sky from a merchant vessel that had been hit. The patches of flames where aircraft had crashed. As dusk fell, a terrific Stuka attack developed. A dive bombing raid obviously carried out by picked pilots. When darkness closed down and gave us a somewhat modified relief, there was a disconcerting thought that the same darkness would be providing cover for the e-boats and u-boats whom we knew would be lurking near the Sicilian narrows, which we had to pass before daylight. The convoy suffered, and so did the e-boats. It was an ugly, uncomfortable night, and I must confess to a sigh of relief as the dawn broke. Thursday now, the relief was short-lived. Almost with the first streaks of Thursday's light, back came the dive bombers and torpedo droppers in a final desperate effort to get the convoy on its last lap. The situation had changed now. We were within range of the fighters from Malta. At first, the fighter protection from the island was limited by distance. But as we got nearer home, the enemy began to feel more and more the effect of the Spitfires. The convoy had got through. Although it seems invidious to draw attention to any one of so gallant party, I must do so, for she was carrying the most important and dangerous cargo of all, oil. Her name was Ohio. Not only was she hit by a torpedo, but constantly bombed throughout. While destroyers stood by her, the crew repeatedly got the flames under control. If ever there was an example of dogged perseverance against all odds, this was it. Here you see the British crew of this American-built oil tanker ashore in Malta after their ordeal. They will be remembered by everybody in Malta for what they did. They will go down in Britain's sea history as heroes. And a little later, home in Britain again, Captain Mason of the Ohio goes to Buckingham Palace to be decorated. Now we can count the loss in the game. On this convoy, our planes and guns certainly destroyed 66 enemy planes and sank two U-boats. Two Italian cruisers were hit by torpedoes, one badly damaged. But our own losses were heavy. We lost the aircraft carrier Eagle and the cruiser Manchester, in addition to smaller escort craft and merchant vessels. But the precious supplies were got through. Malta is no longer a fortress on the defensive, but a springboard for the offensive in Europe. Malta is going over to the attack.
1944, Rome was free, liberated after 21 years of fascist rule. The Allied Fifth Army entered the Eternal City from the south, acclaimed by cheering multitude. Through the streets, where the chariots of the Caesars once rolled, tanks and trucks rumbled past historic landmarks, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Victor Emmanuel Memorial, tomb of Italy's unknown soldier, the Piazza Venezia, where Mussolini looked down from his balcony upon the people he had led to sorrow and ruin. The liberation of Rome was part of an all-out offensive in Italy, coordinated with drives upon the Nazi fortress from England and Russia. The Germans were driven from Rome exactly nine months in a day after the beginning of the Allied campaign in Italy. Conceived by the combined chiefs of staff in Washington, the campaign had two phases. In phase one, we sought to achieve certain preliminary objectives with a limited amount of troops and equipment. What were the objectives of phase one? Most important of all was securing complete control of the Mediterranean. Even after clearing the Axis out of North Africa and overrunning Sicily in 38 days, our shipping was still threatened by Axis air attacks from the Italian mainland. Our second objective? to exploit Mussolini's overthrow by knocking Italy out of the war. Our third objective was to capture the main Nazi airfields at Foggia. Fourth, we wanted to engage the enemy at the quickest point of contact and force him to withdraw as many divisions as possible from the Russian front and the invasion front in Western Europe. Phase one of the Italian campaign began on September the 3rd, 1943 when the British States Army at Messina, under General Montgomery, pushed across the narrow straits towards Calabria, on the toe of the boot. And landed there, virtually unopposed. The towns of the toe were swiftly occupied, and the 8th Army pressed north up the peninsula. By September the 8th, We'd swiftly accomplished one of our objectives when General Eisenhower announced the capitulation of Italy. The Italian fleet surrendered. And 62 Italian divisions laid down their arms. On September the 9th, the American 5th Army, which included a British corps, headed for Salerno, 28 air miles south of Naples. The furthest point which could be protected by an umbrella of fighter planes from our bases in Sicily. At 2 a.m., the first wave went in. Sea's German film shows the Germans entrenched on high ground, overlooking the harbor and beaches. They'd moved in the day before, determined to prevent our landings. Despite heavy enemy fire, the first wave swarmed ashore with timetable precision. But before we could consolidate our positions, the Germans intensified their attacks. The 88mm gun slowed up our landings and imperiled the entire beachhead operation. The Luftwaffe was thrown into the struggle, hampering the landing of additional troops and equipment. But a heavy bombardment from the combined fleets together with support from the Allied Air Forces broke down this resistance. And as a climax, 1,860 sorties were flown against German troop concentrations on September the 14th. On that day, the German news agency announced that Salerno was another Dunkirk. Actually, the beachhead had been secured, despite heavy losses. Meanwhile, the 8th Army was pressing north. On September the 16th, patrols of the 8th and 5th made contact. The 8th was a threat to the German left flank, while the 5th Army counterattacked from the beachhead. The Germans fell back fighting before the Allied assault. Tommies and doughboys drove them out of the foothills and pressed after them. The German withdrawal was complete. General Clark's order of the day read, 
We are here to stay. Side by side with the 8th Army, the 5th Army will advance. On September the 27th, the 8th Army captured the Foggia airfields, achieving three more of our objectives. Our Mediterranean shipping was now relatively safe from air attack. We had secured bases from which our aircraft could operate against the German supply lines in northern Italy. And from Foggia, we could bomb southern Germany and the Balkans. As the Russian armies advanced, we could attack in close support with them, bombing rail junctions and military installations in the German rear. Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, Cloesti, Sofia. On October the 1st, three weeks and a day after the Allied landings at Salerno, the 5th entered Naples, one of the great ports of the world. The damage done by the Germans was soon repaired, and it rapidly became our main supply artery. As our troops pushed north, they passed countless thousands returning to their battle-scarred homes. One month after our landing, we reached the Volterno River. There, the campaign became a battle of rivers and mountains, fought through autumn torrents. progress was slow. Advance units sometimes clung to their rain-soaked positions for 30 days without relief. Mud and mire followed the rains as we struggled forward. Throughout the centuries there have been hundreds of wars in Italy, but only once has it been conquered through the mountains. Winter brought snow, ice and freezing temperatures. A topographical map shows how the mountains lie like an endless row of fortresses, each protected by its moat. A river at right angles athwart our line of march. Here, weeks were consumed forcing a single pass, crossing a single river. A hundred men often held up a thousand. Let us see on this typical situation how the Germans defended a pass and the methods were used to capture it. Beyond the demolished bridges, the Germans laid minefields and emplaced machine guns and anti-tank guns to cover the minefields and bridgehead. Further back, they built pillboxes and concealed artillery just over the crest of the mountains. To take a position like this, we first had to lay down a tremendous artillery barrage. Behind this, our infantry had to swim the river at night, clear away through the minefields and put the machine guns and anti-tank guns out of action. Only then could pontoon bridges be put down and our artillery brought across. Then, as our guns went to work on the pillboxes and on the enemy artillery in the mountains, the infantry captured the pass by working around the enemy's flank, storming the pillboxes from side and rear and silencing them with grenades and flamethrowers. Much of the time, the going was too steep for vehicles and muscle and mule took over. Supplies were brought through over precarious trails. In the east, the Canadians with the 8th Army fought their way through the Sangro Valley. Their attack on Ottorno was met by determined Nazi resistance. Driving in with tanks, the Germans counter-attacked desperately. For seven days, tank battles and hand-to-hand -hand infantry fighting raged through the streets. Germans were finally driven into the northwest corner of the town. Out fought, exhausted, the enemy pulled out. The eighth pressed after them. The tide of battle swept over Ortona and left it in its wake. When General Eisenhower visited the Central Front, it was three months since we had crossed the Volturno. We'd advanced 12 miles in this sector, sometimes at the cost of a man a yard, and were facing Casino, Q. 
key to the strong Gustav line, which the Germans had orders to hold at all costs. Casino lies on the northern slope of the Leary Valley, through which runs the Via Casalina, highway number six. Possession of the valley and the mountains overlooking it from both sides would take us forward to the foot of the last mountains barring our way to Rome. Our plan was to force the Rapido River, both to the north and the south of the town. While the southern force maintained pressure, the northern unit was to circle through the mountains behind it, clean the Germans out of their positions and storm the town from north and rear. At Hangman's Hill, this unit fought for days. Other vantage points changed hands again and again. Finally, another force which had crossed the Rapido from the south fought its way into one third of the town. There, strong enemy resistance turned the battle into a stalemate. The Gustav line ran across the peninsula and was anchored at Casino. To break the stalemate, the 5th Army, including two British divisions, made an amphibious landing at Anzio Natuno, covered by a bombardment from units of the combined fleets. The Germans were caught off guard. For several days, American and British troops encountered only light opposition as they landed and consolidated the beachhead. It was up to the German high command to determine the importance of this new threat to their flank and rear. Marshals Rommel and Kesselring decided against falling back and brought in a mixed force of seven fresh divisions from their dwindling strategic reserves. More and more, we were accomplishing our objective of diverting Nazi divisions from the Western and Russian fronts. The Luftwaffe tried to help these divisions as they sought to drive us into the sea. But the powerful support given by the Navy together with a full exploitation of our air supremacy, enabled us to maintain our foothold. We beat back three powerful German attacks, holding the hundred square miles of beachhead with innumerable small infantry fights, tremendous artillery barrages. British and American soldiers paid a heavy price to hold the Anzio beachhead in casualties and in men captured by the enemy, shown in these Nazi films. Back at Casino, the fight continued. The Germans held an obvious advantage by the occupation of the Benedictine Abbey above the town. They were asked to abandon it and refused. We had no alternative but to bomb the Abbey to save soldiers' lives. One month later, 543 Allied planes tried to blast the enemy out of the town with a load of 1,144 tons of bombs. The Germans took cover in caves and tunnels, and under the abbey itself. In spite of desperate attacks by New Zealanders, the position held. Behind the fighting at Casino, preparations were underway for phase two of the campaign, the all-out assault. Phase one, the preliminary campaign, was drawing to an end. Reinforcements and great quantities of new equipment were brought in. Our forces were regrouping. British and Polish troops in the Leary Valley, Americans in the west along the Garigliano River, the French expeditionary force in the center, and overhead, the fleets of the Allied Air Forces. This was to be a combined operation. During the long winter months, our air forces had pounded the enemy's communications. Now, with the new offensive so close, the air effort was to be stepped up to a staggering figure. The Germans had three main rail lines and three main autostradas on which to carry their vital supplies. Two bomb lines were drawn across Italy, one from Cicino to Ancona and the other from San Stefano to San Bernadetto. 
This was to be our main target area. From Foggia, the key piece in the whole campaign, our bombers could attack and keep on attacking until his rail system was completely destroyed, thereby driving the enemy convoys onto the roads where our fighter bombers could pounce and take their toll. That was the plan ahead of the air forces. By sunset, May the 11th, all these preparations were complete. All along the front, the German-dominated heights were under the muzzles of the Allied guns. At 11 p.m., they went into action. By dawn, the big push was underway. General Alexander, commander of the Allied forces in Italy, told his troops that to them had fallen the honor of striking the first blow in the great final invasion of Fortress Germany. Side by side with the army, the Allied air forces went to work, destroying, as planned, the enemy's now urgently needed supplies. From May the 5th to June the 8th, our aircraft dropped 20,000 tons of bombs on these targets. Once again, the combined fleet swung into action, spreading chaos behind the enemy lines. The airplane was succeeding beyond our hopes. The enemy rail system was paralyzed. In their last gamble, the Germans tried to use road transport. But between May the 20th and June the 9th, in three weeks, our fighter bombers damaged and destroyed 8,491 vehicles. The American 5th Army drove northwards, up the coastal sector. The French Corps forced their way across difficult country with amazing speed. British, Indian and Canadian troops of the 8th Army drove up the Leary Valley, while the New Zealanders forced their way through towards the north. The Allied armies shattered the Gustav Line. By May the 17th, only Casino remained in German hands. British, Indian and Polish troops fought on to capture this key point. On May the 18th, the Poles had taken the battered remains of Casino. The Gustav line had ceased to exist. Prisoners were brought in on every sector of the front. Thousands more were slain. The men who were taken alive were beaten, exhausted, hopeless. The power of our offensive was written in their dazed, haunted faces but there were still many German divisions in Italy that had to be battered to pieces. The Adolf Hitler line swung back like a gate, then crumbled beneath sledgehammer allied blows. On May the 23rd, the Enzio troops broke out of their beachhead area, and two days later, the two groups met at Berger Krapper. After four months of bitter fighting, the beachhead forces had accomplished their mission to threaten the German rear and compel them to fall back. The road to Rome was lined with the wreckage of Nazi legions, blasted by our air power as they fled before the reunited Allied army. In 12 days, the mounting fury of the Allied drive threw the Nazis back to the outskirts of Rome. Films taken by Italian anti-fascists show the evacuation of Rome, one of the greatest blows of the war to Nazi prestige. The streets were practically deserted as the Nazis left. After 21 years, a free Rome laughs again. A free Rome speaks again. A free Rome reads again. Free Rome assembles in the Piazza San Pietro to receive the Pope's blessing. And a free Rome prays.